بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم سيد أمين سر دائم سادة أعضاء الأكاديمية السيد المحاضر سادة والسيدات الحضور الكرام السفراء مع حفظ الألقاب والمهام لكل المدعوين لهذه المحاضرة تواصل أكاديمية أكاديمية المملكة المغربية تقليدا حميدا رسخته منذ ثلاث سنوات بتنظيم سلسلة من المحاضرات يلقيها أساتذة باحثون وأهل الخبرة حول مواضيع لها ارتباط وثيق بموضوع الدورة وذلك رغبة في نسج الارتباط مع المثقفين والخبراء وتقاسم أفكار معهم دعما للثقافة في بلادنا ومن المعلوم أن الموضوع الذي اختارته الأكاديمية للدورة المقبلة السادسة والأربعين دورة السادسة والأربعين استقر حول موضوع آسيا أفقا للتفكير وذلك في سياق انفتاحها على القارة الأسيوية بعد أن نظمت دورتين إحداهما خصصتها لموضوع إفريقيا أفقا للتفكير والثانية أمريكا اللاتينية أفقا للتفكير ويسعدنا اليوم أن نرحب بالمحاضر بالسيد العميد المحاضر جوستين إيفولين لكي يلقي محاضرة بالأكاديمية يسعدنا أن نستقبله طبعا في أكاديميتنا وهو عميد معهد الاقتصاد المهيكل الجديد بجامعة بكين بالصين وحاصل على الدكتوراه في جامعة شيكاغو كما أنه اشتغل منصب نائب الرئيس كاقتصادي في البنك الدولي من 2008 إلى 2012 وقبل ذلك اشتغل لمدة 15 سنة مديرا ومؤسسا وأستاذا للمركز الصيني للبحث الاقتصادي بجامعة بكين وهو مستشار لمجلس الدولة وهو عضو اللجنة الندوة حول الاستشارة السياسية للصينيين كما أن ألف عديدا عددا كبيرا من المؤلفات أكثر من 20 يمكن أن نقول مؤلف حول النمو الاقتصادي وإعادة التفكير في التنمية وحول الاقتصاد الصيني وهو عضو مراسل لأكاديمية البريطانية وعضو مشارك لأكاديمية العلوم من أجل التنمية إذا أعطيه الكلمة يعطي الكلمة للأستاذ وأرحب به مرة أخرى الأستاذ جوستين إيفولين لإلقاء محاضرته حول عنوان صعود الصين وتداعيته بالنسبة للاقتصاد والبلدان النامية لكم الكلمة السيد المحاضر Good afternoon Ladies and gentlemen, it is a great honor for me to speak in this great institution for knowledge and learning. I understand His Majesty King Mohammed the sixth, uh, the sixth is a champion for the South South knowledge sharing and learning. And in that spirit, I would like to talk about the rise of China and its implication for economics and for other developing countries. As you know, China was one of the oldest civilization before the modern times. But after the Industrial Revolution in the late 18th century, China became one of the poorest countries in the world. 
and especially after the Opium War in 1840, China became a semi-colony in the world. And uh, how to rejuvenate China is a dream for the Chinese people. And as a founding of the People's Republic of China in 1949, that was 70 years ago, is a reflection of this dream. But this dream did not become too far away. Only 40 years ago, when China started the transition from a socialist planning economy to a market economy in 1978. In 1978, the per capita GDP, that is the income level of the people in China, according to the World Bank, was 156 US dollars a year. And that was less than one third of the average in sub-Saharan African country in that year. Because according to the World Bank, the per capita GDP was 495, and China was only 156. And compared to Morocco, in that year, the per capita GDP was 689 US dollars. China was 156. So that means China was less than one quarter of the income level in Morocco in 1978. And like other poor country, China, at that time, 81% of the population lived in the rural areas, relied on agriculture for living. And 84% of the population in China, at that time, lived below international poverty line of a dollar and a quarter a day. And uh, like other poor country, at that time, China was also very inward looking because the export was only 4.1% of China's GDP. Import, 5.6% of China's GDP. Combined, it was only 9.7% of China's GDP. That means, it, that means 90% or Chinese economy did not have any interaction with the global economy in 1978. Not only so, among the little export, 75% was either agricultural product or semi or processed agricultural product. On this humble basis, from 1978 to 2000, 18, China maintained 9.4% growth rate continuously for 40 years. I think that in human history, we did not see any country to grow at such a fast rate for such a long time. And also trade performed even better. The average annual growth rate of trade from 1978 to 2018 was 14.5% per year. With such a high growth rate in GDP and in trade, certainly China was transformed. By the time of 2010, China overtook Japan to be the second largest economy in the world. And in the same years, the export in China overtook Germany. China became the largest exporting country in the world. And also among the export, more than 95% was manufacturing goods. So China gained the nickname of factory of the world. And we know, you know Britain was the first country 
to be named as the factory of the world after the Industrial Revolution. Then, in the early 20th century, U.S. became the factory of the world. And after the Second World War, Germany and Japan were the factory of the world. Now China is the factory of the world. And in 2013, trade, that means import and export in China, overtook U.S. China became the largest trading country in the world. And in the year 2014, Chinese economic size, measured by purchasing power parity, overtook U.S. to be the largest economy in the world, measured by purchasing power parity. Last year, the per capita GDP in China reached 9,608 U.S. dollars. China solidly footing on the ground as a high middle income country. And in the past 40 years, more than 700 million people were lifted up the all poverty. And China singularly made the largest contribution to the global effort of fight for poverty. But in spite of all this very remarkable achievement in the past 40 years, I'm sure you often heard of the story about the coming collapse of the Chinese economy. And this kind of prediction you know, will appeal every several years in the past 40 years. So in my talk this afternoon, I'd like to share with you some of my understanding about the following questions. The first question, how come on such a humble basis, as I described at the beginning, China could achieve such a remarkable growth rate in the past 40 years? And my second question is, how come China was so poor before the transition started in 1978? How come China was so poor? And the third question is that, why, in spite of such a remarkable performance, there are so many predictions about the coming collapse of the Chinese economy? But I'd like to say, China is the only economy in the world in the past 40 years that did not encounter an economic crisis or an economic collapse. How can that China did not encounter any crisis, but there's always repeated prediction about the coming collapse of China? And then on the basis of the above analysis, I'd like to draw some lessons for my own profession as economist and also some implications for other developing country with the same dream to achieve prosperity for their nations. For the first question, why it was possible for China to grow so fast for so long? As an economist, my answer actually is very simple. My answer is the late commerce advantages. Because we know economic growth means the continuous rise of per capita GDP, income of the people. But if you want to raise the income of the people, you need to improve the labor productivity continuously. And how to improve the labor productivity of the people? On the one hand, you need to have a technological innovations for the sectors of your production, agriculture and uh, natural resources manufacturing. And you need to raise the labor producti productivity through the technological innovations. But on the other hand, you also need to have a new high value added sector to emerge all the time. And uh, so you can reallocate your resources 
including your labor force, land, capital, from lower value added sector to higher value added sectors. These are the two mechanisms to raise the labor productivity and also to raise the income. And it's also the same for the high income country or for the developing country. But for the high income country, after the industrial revolution, there have been only the global technological frontiers with industries of highest possible value in the world. And that was the reason why they can have high income. But if they already use the best technology and also produce in the highest value added sector in the world, if they want to have technological innovation, they will have to invent the technology. If they want to have a technology industrial upgrading to higher value added industries, they also need to invent the industries. And invention, we know, if they are successful, they can be very profitable. They can have the whole global markets. But most efforts for invention failed. And as a result, the average annual growth rate in high income country, by the mechanism of invention, they achieve on the average, about 3% to 3.5% growth rate every year since the late 19th century to now. That is the performance for the high-income country. On the average, they grow at 3 to 3.5%. But for a developing country, certainly, we also need to rely on technological innovation and industrial upgrading to raise labor productivities and income. But for a developing country, low income means the technology you use are not the best in the world. And the sector you produce do not have the high value added as the high income country. And so there's a technological gap between high income country and a developing country. And, uh, the so-called technological innovation only means in the next period of time, you use a technology which is better than the technology of yours. And you do not have to use the newest technology in the world. In fact, it's possible to borrow technology from the high-income country, and those kind of technology are mature, but with higher productivity than your technology today. And by borrowing the technology, certainly the cost will be lower and the risk will also be lower. And also, the implication of industrial agility only means next period of time, you move to a sector which have higher value added than yours. But as I said, as a developing country, the value added of your sector today is low, and you have a gap with the high-income country. So there's a possibility for a developing country to enter into mature industries, which are mature in the world because the higher income country already produce in those kind of sectors. And uh, you can also borrow technology and uh, learn from them as a way for your industrial upgrading. You don't have to invent the new you know, industry by yourself. And by this way, certainly, the cost and the risk of industrial upgrading would be much lower than invent the new industries. And so theoretically, if a developing country find a way to tap into potential, that potential of learnings from the you know, mature technology and entering into the mature industry that already exists in the world. They can have a faster technological innovation and industrial upgrading than the high-income country. So theoretically, if they find a way to do that, they can grow faster than the high-income country. But how fast? It's an empirical question. And from the Second World War, among the 200 developing economies, 13 found 
the way, found the way to tap into the potential and achieve 7% or more. That means double the growth rate of the high-income country because high-income country grew on the average at 3 to 3.5%. And if you can grow 7% or more, that means your growth rate can be twice as high or even three times as high as a high-income country. And for 25 or more years, so if you can grow twice or three times as fast as high-income country for 25 or more years, certainly you can narrow the gap with the high-income country. And China became one of those 13 economies after 1978. After China transit from a planning economy to a market economy in 1978. So my answer to the first question, simple. It was because of the late common advantages in neighbors China to grow so fast for so long. Then if the late common advantages was the main reason for the success of China in the past 40 years, then how come China did not benefit from that? As I mentioned, after the Industrial Revolution in the you know, second half of 18th century, China became a poor backward country. And the late common advantage has been there for more than two centuries. And how come China did not benefit from that? And my answer is also very simple. China gave up the potential, you know, voluntarily or intentionally. Because as I mentioned, the dream for the Chinese people is to have a rejuvenation. And the idea of the rejuvenation is to make China, you know, to be as rich, as the powerful, as the high-income country. So after the foundings of the People's Republic of China in 1949, China wanted to catch up the high-income country immediately to make the people to have the same income level as a high-income country. And how can you make the people to have the same income level as a high-income country? Certainly, you would have to have the same level of productivity as a high-income country. But if you want to have the same level of productivity as a high-income country, you need to have the same advancement in the modern industries. And not only so, if you want to make the country as powerful as the high-income country, and if you want to be powerful, you need to have strong military. But the strong military is based on the advancement in military machinery, you know, the weapons, the aircraft, the air carrier, all those kind of military equipments. And those kind of military machineries are the products of the most advanced industry in a high-income country. So again, the dream to make the nation strong, that means we wanted to develop those kind of advanced industry immediately. But if you wanted to develop those kind of advanced industry as in a high-income country immediately, on the one hand, they are all protected by patent. You need to pay to use those kind of technologies. But not only so. Even you want to pay, you may not be able to get that. Because, as I mentioned, they related to their military you know, strengths. And they will not you know, transfer those kind of technology to you. So that means that if you want to develop the same level of the advancement in the industries, you will have to reinvent the wheel. You need to do the invention by yourself. But if you do the invention by yourself, you give up voluntarily the late commercial advantage of borrowing of learning from a high-income country. And not only so, those kind of industries were very capital intensive. But in 1949, China certainly 
was a poor agrarian country. Capital was scarce. And China did not have competitive advantages in those kind of capital intensive industries. Firms in those kind of capital intensive industries were not viable because China did not have competitive advantages. We know that capital intensive industry, the most important cost is capital cost. But China was a capital skills economy. Capital was extremely expensive. So that means the cost of production in the capital intensive industry in a poor country like China would be much higher than the high income country. So that means in an open competitive market, those firms were not viable unless the government you know, gives all kind of protections and the subsidies to those kind of urban sectors. And the protection and subsidies will cause all kind of government interventions in the economic system, all kind of distortions in the economic systems. So that means with the government mobilization and direct support to the capital intensive industries, but the cost will be the misallocation of resources due to those kind of government interventions and uh, distortions. So with this kind of planning system, China was able to test the nuclear weapon in 1960s. China was able to launch the satellite in the 1970s. But the productivity level was so low due to, on the one hand, give up, give up the day comes out one teacher. And on the other hand, the distortions causing all kind of misallocation of resources. And that was the reason why China was so poor. And only up to 1978, China started to develop our economies according to our competitive advantages. China certainly, at that time, had a lot of surplus labor in agricultural sectors. As I mentioned, 81% of the population live in the rural areas and without agriculture. Their productivity level was extremely low. And uh, as a result, China was poor and uh, the wage rate was low. And uh, when China started in 1978 to develop the labor intensive industries, that was consistent with the competitive advantage of abundant supply of labor and with cheap wage rate. So China became very competitive. And with very com competitions, certainly China grow fast, China accumulate capital fast, and with the accumulation of the capital, the competitive advantage in China changes. And gradually, from the labor intensive industry to more capital intensive, more technological intensive industries. And when China climb up this industrial ladder, step by step, certainly China can benefit from the late commerce advantages. And that was the reason why China could grow so fast for so long. But with such a remarkable performance, how come there's always the prediction of the coming collapse of the Chinese economy? I think the reason was because China was not alone in this kind of journey. After the Second World War, all the developing countries gaining political independence from the colonial power and started their own journey for the modernization and industrialization. And among the 200 developing countries, some of them were in the socialist camp. And all those in the socialist camp they adopted a similar planning system and with the intention to develop the large scale modern capital intensive industries like China. But other developing countries, even they were not in the socialist camp, but their development thinking was similar. Because after the industrial, after the political independence, every country want to be modernized, industrialized to be as rich as the high-income country. So they all wanted to develop the modern, large-scale, you know, heavy industries. 
And academic thinking at that time also advised the developing country to you know, develop the modern large scale industries. And certainly, those kind of large scale modern industries on a market basis could not be developed spontaneously. So the idea at the time was there were all kind of market failures in the you know, market system. And if you have a market failures, could not develop this kind of modern large scale industry, you need to have the government to intervene. You need to have the government to mobilize resources to you know, allocate resources directly to the modern industries. And uh, the, those kind of developing thinking at that time was the so-called structuralism. And according to the structuralism, a developing country, if they want to achieve modernization and industrialization, they should use the government intervention to adopt the input substitution strategies and with the government directly you know, mobilize resources, allocate resources to develop modern industry. But certainly, they all encounter the similar problems. They all facing the problems of, on the one hand, they might be able to build a few large scale modern industries, but they all become something called the white elephant. They cannot perform well. And as a result, their economy is stagnant. Their income gap with the high income country continue to widen. And so in the 1978, when China started this transition from the government that grows to the market economy, all the socialist countries had the similar transition. And other developing countries, they all have the similar transition from the government debt growth model input substitution model to you know, free markets. But at that time, the understanding about the reason why the developing country could not catch up, could not perform well. The idea changed from the structuralism to the neoliberalism. At that time, the understanding why the developing country could not do well in their economic performance. It was because there were too many government interventions, too many government you know, values. And if they want to have a well performance in their economies, they should have similar market institution as in a high income country. Because the goal is to move from you know, government-led planning economy or import substitution economy to uh, market economies and so at the time, the argument was that if you want to have a market economy, all the prices should be determined by the market. And then you know, the prices can guide the allocation of the resources efficiently. So that is the first principle. If you want to establish the market successfully, you need to have a marketization, allow market to determine all kinds of prices. And in the past, the government set the prices. And, and those kind of prices, you know, with all kind of distortion. So you know you need to allow the market to set the prices. That's one thing. And secondly, you also need to privatize, privatize all the state-owned enterprises. In the before the transition, the socialist country, all the enterprises are owned by the state. And not only in a socialist country, in fact, in almost all the developing countries adopting the import substitution strategy, they also use the state-owned enterprises to develop those kind of large-scale, capital-intensive modern industries. And the argument at that time is that you need to privatize all those large-scale state-owned enterprises. Because if the enterprises were owned by the state, they do not care about the price signals. Because if the state-owned enterprises facing up the rising of the cost of input, certainly then they are going to have some losses. But the state-owned enterprises, they do not care about that because the government will cover those kind of loss losses. And uh, if the output of the state-owned enterprises increase, well, according to the market, then the firm should have more incentive to produce more. But if the firms is owned by the state, 
they will not have the incentive to produce more because if they make more profit, those kind of profit will be remitted to the state and the manager of the worker will not be benefit from that. And so to make the price, to be able to guide the resource allocation, then they should privatize the state owned enterprises. And the argument seems to be very convincing also. And the third element, as you know, is the stabilization. You know, you should not have the high inflation. Because if you have high inflation in the economy, then you are distorted the behaviors of the consumers and the producers. Because for the consumer, if they face the rising prices for you know, good they are going to consume, then they are going to have some kind of rush to buy more goods in order to, you know, to, 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 to safeguard themselves from high prices in the future. But if you are producers, if you see the prices of your product rises, you're going to keep more inventory and uh, to share those products later because then you know, the prices will increase more and you can make more profits. So by that, if you have inflation in the economies, both the consumers' behaviors and the producers' behavior will be distorted. And to avoid those kind of scenarios, you should not have inflation. But how can you avoid inflation? the government should not have a budget deficit. If the government has a budget deficit, then eventually they will monetize the deficit. That means they will increase the money supply, and if the government increases the money supply, the inflation rate will come. And so the idea was, if a country, a developing country, want to have a successful transition from a planned economy to a market economy, they should implement the so-called Washington Consensus. Marketization, privatization, and a stabilization simultaneously in a Big Ben approach. And we often have some joke about economists. One joke is that if you raise one question to ask five economists, they will give you six answers. And every answer seems to be so convincing, and no one can convince the others. So that's one joke. But in 1992, when Larry Summers, one of the you know, intellectual leaders in the world, he was the chief economist of the World Bank at the time. He wrote an article, this time for the developing country, to transit from the government-led import substitution institution or planning economy to a market economy, there was a consensus among all the economists in the world that was to implement the privatization, the marketization, privatization, and the stabilization simultaneously. So it seemed to be very convincing. But given the transition from a planned economy to a market economy, China did not follow this consensus. China adopted a very gradual, piecemeal, dual track approach. On the one hand, the government continuously providing all kinds of subsidies and protections to the old sectors, which were capital intensive, which were owned by the state. China did not carry out privatization. China did not carry out marketization. China continue to provide the transitory protection and the subsidies to the older sectors. But China debilized the entry into the new labor-intensive sectors, which are consistent with China's comparable advantages. And uh, this approach, at the time, was considered as the worst possible approach. Because according to the theory, that approach means that in a Chinese system, the state and the market exist simultaneously. They both, you know, in the system to allocate resources simultaneously. And many prices were distorted by the state during the transition process. And they thought this was the worst possible approach because 
with the government distortion in a market system, you are going to cause the rent and the rent seeking with the corruption. And this kind of rent seeking will cause, will cause the income disparities. And uh, during the transition, yes, the corruption became very widespread. And the income disparity also getting worsening all the time. And uh, because those kind of adverse effects was predicted by the mainstream ideas. And so whenever the Chinese economy slowed down, then they would say, hey, I know your system cannot work. So now your system, now your economy slowed down means your economy is going to collapse. So that was the reason why during the past 40 years, repeatedly you, you know, heard all kind of prediction about the coming collapse because they saw so many institutional distortions in the Chinese system. However, those countries follow the Washington Consensus reform. Retrospectively, their economy collapsed, stagnant, and hit by crises all the time. Not only so, they also encounter all kinds of corruption issues, all kinds of income disparity issues. And according to many empirical studies by the World Bank, by the, Asia, by the European Development Banks, and by individual economists in former civilian, in Eastern European countries, in Latin America, in Africa. Actually, those countries follow the Washington Consensus Reform. Their corruption and their income disparity issues were even worse than the situation in China. So how come? The Washington Consensus seems to be so convincing. If you want to have a well-functioning market economy, certainly the prices should be determined by the market. And if you want to have a well-functioning well in a market system, then the firm should be responsive to the price signals. And to do that, you need to marketize. And certainly, you also need to maintain stability. The theory seems to be so convincing, but how come the result was just the object? I think that the main reason was because the Washington Consensus neglect that the distortions was, were endogenous to the need of protect those kind of non-viable firms in the capital intensive modern sectors. Because as I mentioned, those kind of sectors win against the country's competitive advantages. And in an open competitive markets, those firms were not viable. Without protection and subsidies, they will go bankrupt. So with the recommendation of the Washington Consensus, government remove all the distortion and interventions, subsidies. Many firms will go bankrupt and causing you know, large-scale unemployment. And if you have a large-scale unemployment to emerge, certainly you are not going to have social political stability. And without social political stability, you cannot have economic growth. That's one, on the one hand. And on the other hand, as I mentioned, many of those kind of large-scale capital-intensive industries are related to national defense. And if you allow them to go bankrupt, the country will be deprived the, with the ability to have national security. And but one good example is Ukraine. If you allow all those kind of industry to go bankrupt, you are not going to have any ability to defend your nation. We know that Ukraine used to be able to produce air carrier, used to be able to produce the largest airplane in the whole world. Certainly, they can also produce nuclear weapons. But in the 1990s, they removed all the subsidy and protection and allow those kind of military complex to go bankrupt as a result. 
when Russia wanted to take back the Crimea. They could not do anything. And now in their eastern borders, they have all kinds of revolution. The government could not do anything. But not, most countries will not be so naive. So even after the privatization of the large scale, kept the intensive modern industries, due to the national security concern, most countries continue to provide necessary subsidies and protection to those kind of old sectors in an even more disguised way. And in the 1990s, I wrote, published books, and I wrote many articles to argue with many economists in my own country and also in the world. Because at that time, the understanding how come the government would subsidize the state owner prices, they said it was because of ownership issue, because they are owned by the state. And if you privatize them, then the government you know, would not have to subsidize them anymore or protect them anymore. But my argument at that time, it was because of those kind of firms carried some kind of policy burden due to the government you know, strategic consideration. They were in sectors which are necessary for the national defense. And it's a policy decision by the government. And I call that kind of you know, situation as some kind of policy burdens. If you have policy burdens, certainly you are going to have policy incurred, you know, policy induced losses. Who should be responsible? For those kind of policy induced losses, the government should be responsible. And if those kind of policy burdens were not eliminated, privatization will make the situation even worse. Because if they are owned by the state, the managers are state employees. It, they will use the, 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 the argument with our subsidy and protections, we cannot survive. And the government cannot refuse to give them subsidy and protections. But after they receive the subsidy and protections, it's very hard to avoid on-the-job consumption. <laughs> but they cannot put those kind of money into their own pocket directly. Because to put those kind of subsidies into their pocket, it's a corruption, it's a crime. And so if they wanted to do that, they can only do that in you know, secretly in a small scale. But after the privatization, private owners will not subsidize the state. They will go to the government to argue for the subsidies with the same reasoning. But after the privatization, privatization the more they get from the state, the more they can put it into their pocket. It's legal. And certainly they will have higher incentive to argue for subsidy and protections. And when they go to the government to argue for subsidies and protections, who are the government? The government officials represent the government. Then they will tell the government officials, why not give me more subsidies? Then, you know, because those money are not your money. Those money are state's money. And if you give me more subsidies and protections, I can open a Swiss account, Swiss bank account, and we can split those kind of subsidies and protections. And certainly, many government officials will do that. And it was based on economic reasoning in the 1990s, when I debate with many economists in the world. And now there are so many empirical evidence to support my argument. I'm sure that a few years ago, there was a very famous, you know, the so-called Panama Papers. And in the Panama Papers, there are thousands and thousands, you know, cases that after the privatization, the private owners, you know, firm some kind of coalition with the government officials to get subsidy, more subsidies from the state and split the subsidy among the private owners and the government officials. And under the kind of situation, certainly, not only their economy collapsed, stagnant, hit by crisis, their corruption issue, their income disparity issue, 
or even worse. But how come China can avoid that? As I mentioned, China adopted a very pragmatic dual track gradual approach. On the one hand, continue to provide subsidies and protection to the state-owned enterprises, and supervise the state-owned enterprises, maintain stability, control the subsidies. But China also liberalized the entry to the new sectors. Not only liberalized the entry to the new sectors, the Chinese government proactively facilitated the entry to those kind of sectors. Because at the beginning, the infrastructure in China was very poor. Although those kind of sectors were China's competitive advantages. And it only means that the factor cost of production in those kind of sectors can be low in international comparison in China. But to be competitive in the international markets or even domestic market, it's a competition of the total cost. The total cost, including the factor cost of production, which determined by the factor endowments of the country, but also transaction cost. The transaction cost depends on whether you have good infrastructure or not, whether your business environment is good enough or not. Certainly, at the beginning, the infrastructure in China was very poor. The business environment was very poor uh, also. And the Chinese government adopt, adopt, adopted a very pragmatic approach. Certainly, it would be desirable to improve the infrastructure for the whole nation and the business environment for the whole nation. But you know, if you want to do that, you need to have huge amount of fiscal resources and implementation capacities. But no country had those kind of resources. No country had those kind of you know, implementation capacity. So China set up special economic zone, or export processing zone, or industrial parks. Within the zone and the parks, to make infrastructure good enough, within the zone or parks, to have one-stop services. So immediately, the transaction cost in those kind of own crates reduce dramatically and could turn the sectors which we have comparative advantage to become our national competitive advantages. So China can grow very fast. And with the growth of the new sectors, China certainly could accumulate capitals. And gradually, our competitive advantages change from labor intensive to more capital intensive. And gradually, the older sector which was capital intensive became the competitive advantage of the Chinese economy because now China become more capital abundant. And by that, if the older sector became China's competitive advantages, firm in those kind of sectors should be viable in open competitive market. If they are viable, protection and subsidy would become unessential. Then the government you know, remove all those kind of you know, uh, uh, remaining distortions in the Chinese system and a transit from a planning economy first to the dual track. On the one hand, the government continue to intervene. On the other hand, the market you know, function. Then converge to a market system because by the time we don't need to you know, intervene anymore. And that was the reform you know, adopted by the Chinese government in 2013. So from this understanding, what are the implications for modern economics? If we look at the modern, modern economics, for example, the first generation of development economics, as I mentioned, was structuralism. And the structuralism explained how come the developing country was so poor. Then they say it was because your labor productivity was poor. And because you are in those kind of you know, primary sectors, agriculture, or resources sectors. And if you wanted to have you know, high income, you should have the you know, advanced sectors. Those kind of argument 
seems to be very convincing. However, the structuralism great the facts. Economic structure in a country is endogenous. The reason why the high-income country, they operated in the capital-intensive in, in sectors. It was about capital, you know, advanced country, they were endowed with abundant supply of capitals. Because since the Industrial Revolution, they have grown fast. And then they accumulate very, a lot of capitals. In a developing country, in the modern times, you are, you know, end up with the scarcity of capital. So you do not have competitive advantage in those kind of capital intensive industry. But the structuralism, the ideas of development economics in the 1950s, 1960s, they neglect that. And as a result, their recommendation, you know, although with good intention, but they failed. And then the second generation of development ideas, the neoliberalism. The neoliberalism, they negate the distortions, in fact, are also endogenous. They are endogenous to the need of protection and subsidize the old sectors. And if you remove all those you know, distortions without changing the fundamental condition to eliminate the non viability of the older sectors, then again, good intention can cause a very poor result. And uh, so fundamentally, the reason why the developing country could not do well in the process of the development or in the process of transition, it was because they are always guided by wrong ideas. And those kind of wrong ideas always came from using the high-income country as a reference. To see what the high-income country have, and otherwise the developing country to have those kind of things as in high-income country. For example, structuralism. Otherwise, the developing country to own the same modern advanced industries as in a high income country with good intention. Or to look at what a high income country could do well and a developing country could not do well, like the neoliberalism. Certainly, high income country could do well in the market institution. And developing countries certainly they could not do well in a market institution because they had all kinds of distortions. But they otherwise the developing country to do as in the high income country. So those kind of intentions seem to be, you know, very desirable, but the result always very poor. And then if we look at a few successful developing country, a few successful developing country after the Second World War, they always have something in common. That is, they did not follow the mainstream ideas. For example, after the Second World War, a few East Asian economies, like Korea, Taiwan, China, Singapore, Hong Kong, in the 1950s, 1960s, they did not develop those kind of large scale money industry. They developed small scale traditional labor intensive industry. They did not adopt import substitution. They follow the expo orientation. And those kind of strategy was considered as wrong strategies. In the 1950s, 1960s, the argument seemed to be very convincing. If a high-income country operates in such a you know, high-productivity labor, uh, capital-intensive sectors, and if you develop a traditional small-scale labor-intensive industry, the labor productivity in those kind of sectors was so low, and how can you catch up the high-income country? So that approach was considered as wrong approach, but it was successful. And uh, in the transition period, China, Vietnam, and actually the first country to adopt those kind of pragmatic dual track approach was Mauritius. 
Mauritius, before 1970s, also adopt import substitution and with all kinds of distortions. And they started to have a transition from the import substitution in a regime to you know, market regime. And again, they adopt, adopted a very gradual piecemeal. At the beginning, they only set up one export processing zone to develop a garment textile and to invite foreign direct investment from Taiwan and Hong Kong. At the beginning, they did not remove any distortion domestically. And again, at that time, those kind of approach was considered as wrong approach because as I just elaborated. That means you have a market system and a government intervention system to coexist. At that time, the idea was that that kind of system was the worst possible approach. But actually, now a few successful economies, they all adopt those kind of worst possible approaches. So it gives us you know, some lessons. Just like Kim Mohammed mentioned, we need to learn the experiences from the thousand country, from the developing country, to understand how come some were able to be successful, but most failed. And the most failed is, is explained. They were guided by wrong ideas. And a few successful ones, they seem to be able to do something which even were considered as wrong from the mainstream ideas, but they were. They work in their country. And the few successful countries are summarized in this way. A few successful countries, they always use themselves as reference. They look at what they have now. And based on what they have, they can do well. And scale up what they can do well with the government facilitation in a market economy and to make what they can do well become their national competitiveness. What they, can, what they have now certainly refer to their endowment structure. And what, can, what they can do well certainly refer to their competitive advantage based on their endowment structure. And if you have a facilitating state to help the private sectors to overcome market values, then you can quickly turn your comparative advantages to your competitive advantages. And by that, you can immediately create a job, export, earning, revenue, and growth. And with that, certainly, you're going to change your endowment structure, gradually from capital scarcity to capital abundance. And that, you can clamp up the industrial aid to more capital intensive uh, sectors. And in this process, you can benefit from the you can benefit from the late commercial advantages. So with this understanding, a country like China was trapped in poverty for centuries. And China you know, tried to rejuvenate the nation with all kinds of effort. When China followed the inappropriate ideas to build up the modern large scale industries, Although those kind of strategy enable China to have a strong military with nuclear weapon, with the satellite, but the productivity level were very poor, so people in China suffered. And only after 1978, China changed the approach. You know, try to do something according to our national realistic condition and adopt the approach very pragmatically to look into what we can do well and uh, to make what we can do well become competitive. At the same time, maintain the stability of the economy. And I think that, that this lesson may be valuable for any other developing country with the same gene to modernize the nation, with the same gene to make the nation rich, and to do that you need to look at what you have now and find a way to turn what you have now into you know, what you can be competitive in domestic market and international market. Thank you.
thank you, thank you, uh, you for, for your interesting conference and uh, for your contribution of sharing with us your thoughts, analysis uh, about the model of China and the rise of China from a poor country to be a second eco economy in the world. Thank you very much. Uh, I think there is a lot of uh, things to be discussed and to think uh, about. Ashkuru muhadran ala hadihi muhadara al qayyima alati kama lahatum hiya tahlilun li masar masar balad yani kharaja min min a'maq al faqr yani kama halala dalik ila an yakuna yani tani iqtisad fi al alam wa an yahaqqiqa ma yumkin an nusamiyahu bil inbi'at ولكن يعني يطرح دائما سؤال لماذا حققت الصين ما حققت هو كما حل لسيد المحاول العميد المحاضر يعني بفضل طبعا بعض الاختيارات الاقتصادية المفكر فيها والتي تتعلق أساسا بالاختيارات لدى القيمة المضافة مع اعتبار يعني واقع الواقع واقع صيني و يعني بشكل براغماتي والدور الذي لعبته أساسا الدولة في هذه الاختيارات نشكره ونفتح الباب لبعض We will have some questions Okay, a very short discussion Okay بعض الأسئلة نحضر جوجة الأسئلة ولا ثلاثة Well, thank you very much. You made us live a marvelous story. But isn't your size, the size of your country, what is its effect on the very good and high development of, of China? I live the development in Morocco, but, but we have never been competitive with the European market. We always had to deal with our small market. We could not do any industry due to our small size. Isn't it your size that has contributed to this very high development progress? First question. The second one is for the future. How is China today with this 5G, with the, you know, this uh, uh, artificial intelligence, with all these new developments? How does it feel compared to this new, uh, to, the old, to the United States, European, etc.? And thank you very much. Okay, is it possible? Okay, thank you. Uh, so, thank you, Professor Yefoli. So, we have enjoyed this very important and insightful uh, conference. I have two uh, questions. The first one has to do almost with the first. Since you said that the self-empowerment of producing technology should be by the country itself. So if we take the case of Morocco, for instance, with a small scale market, and in terms of cost benefits, today there is some economics who said it's not that much beneficial for a small country to focus on producing technologies. So I would like your insight. The second one, which is very impressive in the narrative of the success story of China, is this capacity to balance between the belonging of China to developing countries. So this is the general discourse, I mean the economics and the political discourse. And in the same time, another discourse which is challenging to become the first economic power. So how this capacity to put them all together, this is a wonderful story we would like to explain for us at least the insights of this capacity of combination. Thank you. Mr. Professor, uh, thank you very much for your uh, very interesting and very rich conference. Our 
chance, big chance for us and for you and for China. The, as is the China happily no has a colonialistic past. No. Uh, indeed, in Af for Africa and for many countries through the world, uh, consider Africa uh, like a strong paradigm and fantastic model. However, in the United States and Europe, there is, there is a critical trend about uh, many questions, especially your uh, communist regime, your unique party, and uh, the question problems about the human rights, the freedom, etc. I, 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 uh, I, would you like to give me, to give us, your answer about those questions? And uh, the last point is uh, what are your uh, ideas and hypotheses about uh, the present economic, economical war between uh, your country with China and the uh, United States. United State. Thank you very much. First, uh, I would like to thank you for this excellent uh, talk, and I think it's very interesting for us. And as you said, uh, there is many lessons, of course. Uh, but I have a few questions. So first of all, I will say that uh, China is one of the few developmental countries, what is not the case of most of the developing countries. And that means two things, very important. The political organization of the country, of course, and this possibility to have long-term politics and policies. And that is very important. And uh, I think that we have, of course, to insist on that. Second thing that is important in what you said is uh, at least for the 10 last years or perhaps more, the, the growth is driven by technology. I think that it's uh, an economy driven by technology. But I didn't hear one word, the word research in all of this. You didn't say anything about word research. Although we know that research now in China is the second is the word in all the fields. And I think that only last year, the growth of uh, graduate budget was 17%, which is very important. And the number of research in China, I think, is huge. Uh, and incomparable all over the world, I understood that more than 400,000 PhDs and postdocs that st studying in, in Western countries, and now 95% of them came back to China. So I think that is very important. And I think that makes a difference with us. Developing countries have has no market, they don't have resource for research, uh, they have not enough capital for, for a course, for technology, and so on. So I think that the model is good, but perhaps we have to adapt it. And my last question, do you think that the world economy model, based on growth and consumption, is a lasting model? Or perhaps it's going to collapse in a few years? And I think at this time, perhaps China will be the, state, the only country that will be able to survive, of course, with more than one billion people, of course, in China. What is your opinion on that? Thank you. Thank you, Professor Lin, for the amazing talk. I have a question about the demographic dividend. China's amazing period of growth coincided with its demographic dividend period but it also coincided with the demographic dividend in high income countries. So you had these high income, you know, income demographic dividend rich countries importing from a low income demographic dividend. So kind of a high wage 
demographic dividend met a low wage demographic dividend. And I wonder how for tomorrow's low income, labor rich economies experiencing a demographic dividend, how will they be able to tap into growth when most of the high income countries are population aging instead? So how can tomorrow's low income countries grow when most of the world's rich countries will be population old instead? Euh, <coughs> Mourad Alami, universitaire, écrivain et traducteur. Euh, Juan Ying, professeur Justin Lin. 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 Je ne sais pas. La prononciation, c'est un petit peu difficile. J'étais en 1995 à Shanghai. Et la plupart des autoroutes urbaines était mais vraiment gigantesque. On disposait déjà de quatre jusqu'à six voies. Et il y avait uniquement, ou presque 90%, il y avait uniquement des bicyclettes. Et naturellement, la voiture qui roulait, c'était Santana. Pas plus. Alors, je suis revenu euh, en Chine 2014. J'ai été invité par une université chinoise où j'ai passé naturellement cinq années là-bas en tant qu'universitaire et j'ai publié deux livres sur, une question, vous plaît. <rire> sur la Chine. Mais vraiment, ce que je voudrais bien savoir, est-ce que euh, le développement économique de la Chine peut se traduire par uniquement par le progrès, parce que vous avez un mot en, chine, en chinois, et ça se dit « jinpu ». Shukran. Thank you. Okay. You have the floor to answer these questions. <laughs> well, all these are very good questions. And uh, certainly I will not be able to answer all the questions fully. And that means I should come back next time to exchange ideas uh, with all these good questions. <laughs> the first one is about the size of the economy. Certainly, China has the largest population size in the whole world. But I think the size of the economy is not so important for the economic success. Because before 1978, China was much poorer than any other country. I mentioned that in 1978, the per capita GDP in China was less than one third of the average in sub Saharan African country. In 1978, the per capita GDP in China was less than one quarter of Monaco. China at that time had one billion population already. So size from Chinese experience is not so important. But we can also look at other successful country. I mentioned Mauritius. In 1970, before they started to take off, the population size in Mauritius was half a million. And now Mauritius has per capita GDP over 10,000 US dollars. And also Singapore. In the 1960s, its population size was only 2 million. And now they have 7 million. But still a small economy in terms of population size. But the per capita GDP in Singapore last year was higher than the US. So from both China's experiences and a few other successful economies, it means population size was not the important determinant of the economic success. As I mentioned, ideals is the most important one. If you follow the right ideals, no matter you have a large population 
or not, you can be successful. If you follow a wrong ideas, no matter what kind of favorable condition you have, you are doomed to fail. So that's the first question. The second question about the future of artificial intelligence. I think for that sector, China has some kind of competitive advantages. Because for the artificial intelligence, the invention first is a short cycle. Every 18 months, 12 months, you have a new product. And uh, the invention of those kind of new products relies mostly on human capital. And uh, financial capital, which capital, uh, are not so important. And uh, you know, certainly China now is a high middle income country with per capita GDP of 9,600 compared to the US, it has 62,000 US dollars. We do not have as many financial capitals or physical capital as US. But I think in terms of human capitals, we can compete or even over compete with the US. So that is the reason why I'm confident about the future of China. So that's the you know, first one. Thank you very much for two very nice questions from you. And the second one is, there's ideas of you know, develop technology by yourself. And uh, if you want to develop technology by yourself, whether large population size is important, that related to the first question. Again, I think if you develop the technologies which you have competitive advantages, population size domestically is not important. Because if you have competitive advantages, you can help the whole global markets. So the domestic you know, economic size is not a determinant. And that's the reason why the richest country, many of them are small economies, like Switzerland, like Finland, like you know, Switzerland, uh, uh, Sweden, and Singapore. And even to a large extent, Korea, its population size is about the same as Morocco. You have 30 million, and Korea has you know, third, about less than 40 million. Taiwan, China only have 24 uh, million, and its population size you know, is smaller than Morocco. But they can compete internationally because they develop the technologies which they have competitive advantages in the sector of which they have competitive advantages. So the new technology can compete in the global markets. So again, I think that the most important thing in my talk, you need to look at what you have and based on what you have, what you can do well. And that is, means your competitive advantages. If you work on the sectors, that you have competitive advantages. Certainly, you also need to have new technologies. But those kind of new technologies, if you have that, you can compete in international markets. And only you want to develop certain kind of technology which go against your competitive advantages. That means, that means you cannot compete in the international market because you do not have competitive advantage in that. But even uh, you can invent or own those kind of technologies. Large population size will not help either. Before 1978, as I mentioned, China you know, wanted to develop those kind of very capital intensive modern industries. It went against China's competitive advantages. And uh, we needed to protect them. And as we were successful in inventing those kind of technology, so we could have nuclear weapon, we could launch the satellite in the 1970s and 1960s. And even with larger population size, we were still very poor because we still, not can, we still could not compete in international markets. So I think it's very important to have the spirit of innovations. But it's not necessarily mean you need to invent everything by yourself. If you have the possibility of borrowing technology, it might be better to borrow technologies and, and uh, to be able to compete in the international market. 
Then the second question is that China may become the first power. And I think it's unavoidable. Because in this way, I'm a Marxian. Economic basis determine the superstructure. Economic foundation determine the influence. Currently, China is the second largest economy measured by market exchange rate. China is already the largest economy measured by purchasing power parity. And I'm confident China will continue to grow you know, at 6% from now to 2030. China will be able to grow at around 5% from 2030 to you know, 2040s. And Chinese economic size by the time of 2050s, measured by market exchange rate, most likely will be double the size of the US. And uh, measured by purchasing power parity, China will double or will triple the size of the US. By that, China is going to be in the largest economy with large influence. But the pattern of the difference of the influence will be different. Recently, someone asked the Prime Minister, you know, uh, 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 of Malaysia, uh, what's the name of the Prime Minister of Malaysia? The Mahathir. And the U.S. warned the Mahathir, said, well, China is going to dominate in, you know, the world, and they said, we need to reduce that. But Mahathir said, well, what's wrong with the regional China? We have, you know, relations. We have interaction with China for more than 2,000 years. And China never colonized us. But once we started to have interaction with the Western power, for two years, our country was colonized. And so, yes, China will rise. China will be influential. But the ideas of influence in China is coming from some kind of mono authorities. But how to gain the mono authorities is to help the others. You are strong, you should help the others. So our philosophy is that, yes, we want to be rich. But the way for us to be rich is to make others to be rich also. We want to be strong, but the way for us to be strong is to help the other to be strong also. So that's the Chinese philosophy. So I think that when the day China becomes the largest economy, most influential economy, I think we are going to have a much better world. Yeah. And then, you know, talk about China does not have colonial past. And whether that is one factor that contribute to the success of China. Well, my philosophy is that always look at what you have now including your past. But your past cannot determine your futures. And I can also give you some examples. Singapore was a colony of Britain. And uh, Taiwan, China, my hometown, was a colony of Japan. Korea was a colony of Japan also. But they were all successful. So even you have a colonial past, if you follow the right ideas, as I described, all these East Asian economies, they always look at what they have now, what they can do well, and uh, no matter they have a colonial past, or they do not have a colonial past, they can be equally successful. Yeah, so that, that's my philosophy, yeah. Then coming to the issue of China and the US relations, Certainly now U.S. engage a trade war with China. And we, my understanding is that we think globalization is good. Trade is always a win-win for everybody. So we hope to have good trade relation, good economic relation with the U.S. But if U.S. wanted to impose a war on us, we cannot escape that. And certainly we will suffer. But U.S. will also suffer. But the rest of the world will suffer. And we hope that U.S. will be more rational. As I mentioned, even with a trade war with the U.S., I'm quite confident China can maintain the momentum of growth. Because 
according to some you know, uh, estimation, if U.S. imposed 25% of the tariff rate on all our export to the U.S., that was 500 billion U.S. dollars a year. If U.S. You know, imposed 25% tariff rate on all those that, certainly it would be better for China. And according to some estimation, it will cause the growth rate in China to drop about half a percentage point. And it will cause the growth rate in the U.S. to drop you know, 0.3 percentage point. China will suffer more. But in a relative scale, U.S. will suffer more. Because according to the IMF, U.S. is likely to grow at 2.5% this year. And so if, due to the trade conflicts, U.S. reduced from 2.5% down to 2.2%, U.S. is going to lose 12 percentage point in its growth rate. And China is most likely to grow at 6 to 6.5% this year. And most likely will be 6.5%. But if there's a trade war, China reduced from 6.5% down to 6%. Our loss in our growth rate was only 8 percentage point. So, you know, I think it's irrational for a country to engage in this kind of trade war on other country. But if U.S. like to do that, we have no choice, and I think we can afford to continue to grow our economy, to advocate for globalization, and a good trade, relation, trade, good trade relation with all the countries in the world. Then about the political organization. Yes, we are lucky to have a communist party which is committed to economic development. But it helps, but it's not the you know, necessary conditions. As I mentioned before, 78. We have the same party with strong leadership, but we did not do well. And after 78, we have the same party, we do well. And uh, we are economists, we know that if, you, you know, if this strong leadership is a static, it, it did not change. But the situation changes, so this should not be the main explanation for the success, right? And also you can look, I mentioned Mauritius several times. Mauritius was a colony, a tiny economy, and they, you know, was the former French colony, and then later on became the colony of Britain, and they inherit the democratic system as in the Britain. So Mauritius did not have a strong leadership as in China, but Mauritius was equally successful. So I think more important, as I mentioned, is right ideas. Every country always has something they own now. And based on their own, they can always find sectors that they have competitive advantages. And if they can you know, turn their competitive advantage into competitiveness, they can grow. And even politically, they are not very stable. Like in Mauritius, they have election every several years. They change the government every several years. But if this policy can work to promote you know, growth, to generate jobs, even the new government will follow the same policy. And that's the reason why I think ideas is the most important and you know, a determinant of economic success in a country. And, 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 and then, you know, technology innovation certainly is very important and China now attracts a lot of return educated PhD, yes, that help. But they return only because the economic growth rate in China is high, provides a lot of opportunities. And uh, without that kind of opportunities, people will not return. You know, like I was born in Taiwan in 1950s, and before 1970s, little of my and our friends returned to Taiwan. But after Taiwan became very prosperous, you know, it attracted a lot of return Taiwanese. And similarly it happened in mainland China. Now, in the 1980s, we sent a lot of 
students abroad, not so many of them return. Now many of them return because there are more opportunity in China than in the US. So I think the best way to guarantee the return of your talents is to have a dynamic growing economy in your country. Then they will find good opportunity in the country to return. Yeah. And the way, and I'm confident, every country can grow dynamically if they have the right ideas about how to develop their economies. Yeah. Then the, you know, talk about the consumption growth and the consumption and the further we are going to hit the limit of the resources. I think it's an idea. It was quite popular in the 1960s. And uh, I'm sure that you remember the book called The Limit to Growth and uh, released by the Roman clubs. And according to the prediction of that book, all the resources will be depleted by the time of 2000. And in that book, they did not even mention the growth of China at all. They did not expect China to grow so fast. And they, even without the growth in China, they predicted, you know, according to the consumption pattern in Europe, in the US, in Japan, by the time of 2000, all the resources in the world will be depleted. But what would you look? Look the oil prices as an example. Now the prices of oil years, even up to you know, 70 US dollars per barrel. But if you look in the real terms, it was even lower than in the 1980s, 1990s. And so I think that science can provide a solution. You know, if you have the growth in the world, certainly they will consume more resources. But the higher prices will induce scientific research to find alternative. And the alternative can, you know, increase the supply of the resources. And by that, I think, you know, we can be optimistic about the future. Because, you know, the ideas of the limitation to the growth always based on the Masutian ideas. Masutian ideas that if you allow the population to grow, then we are going to have chaos in the world because we are not going to produce enough food for the people. But actually, in the Masutian ideas, they, he did not put technological changes in the models. And again, in the ideas of Roman club, the limit, the limit, the limit to growth, again, you know, in that book, they did not you know, factor in the possibility for technological changes. And I'm sure that you know, the potential technological changes is huge, especially the industry, you know, industrial revolution 4.0, or artificial intelligence that can unleash a lot of potential for the future. Then the demo demographic dividend. I think that there's always opportunities there. For example, yes, now you may face the aging in Europe and also the you know, decline growth rate in Europe. But China is rising. The population size in China, 1.4 billion. You know, and uh, that was three times of the population in Europe. Three times of the population in, in the US. And actually, it doubled the population in high income country. Currently, only 15% of the population in the world live in high income country. And China has 19% of the population in the world. And most likely, by the time of 20, 25, China will become a high-income country. And by that time, as a high-income country, China will not produce those kind of labor-intensive products. China will import those kind of labor-intensive products. And uh, in fact, China already started to import the labor-intensive products from Vietnam, even from Ethiopia. So I think the opportunity will be there. So we don't have to be pessimistic. Uh, <clears throat> and you talk about 95, you first time visit Shanghai. Certainly, if you come back, you know, in the last few years, you will be so much impressed. 
1978, as I mentioned, China was one of the poorer countries. And with 9.5% growth rate, continuously for 40 years, the economic size in China increased 36 times. 36 times enlargement in 40 years. And you talk about car, I'd like to give you a personal story also. I returned to mainland China in 1987 as the first one in my, in my generation to return my home country with a PhD degree in social sciences. I graduated from Chicago in 1986. I returned to you know, Peking University in 87. And I was the first one in my generation to return with a PhD degree in social sciences, not only in economics. At that time, the Chinese government had one policy to encourage people like me to return, but not many of them return, okay? Because the second one returned was in 1994. In seven years, there no one returned, okay? But to attract me to return, the government gave a very attractive you know, policy. I could import a car without paying custom duty. At the time, the custom duty was 200%. So that means if I you know, purchase a car in the US compared to the prices in China, it was only one third, okay. So with that incentive, I imported a car a passenger car in 87. And at the time, although the government had a policy, but there was so many red tapes for me to go through in order to be able to drive the car on the street. It took me nine months to go through the red tapes to be able to drive my car on the street. And so that was in March 1988. I went to get my license. And the transportation authority told me, my car is the second privately owned car in the whole city of Beijing. That was 1988. My car was very small. It was Toyota Corolla. But the sense of driving the car was better than driving uh, not only Mercedes-Benz, than driving of uh, Los Royals. Because when I drove my small Toyota Corolla on the street, everyone paid attention to me because my car was considered so cute at the time. And that was the second property owner car. And now how many property owner car in Beijing? More than six million property owner car in the city of Beijing. And so with the growth of 9.4%, actually a country can be transformed in one generation. And I think Morocco can be transformed in one generation if the policy for the right ideas. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Lin. And uh, we hope that we will have the opportunity to hear you again uh, in uh, our academy. And uh, you are always uh, welcome <laughs> to come and uh, to, to discuss with us our thoughts. Thank you. Shukran lakum jami'an wa ila muhadaratin ukhra.